All right, we'll get started. So uh, welcome, everybody. I uh, hope you guys had a great uh, conference yesterday. Really enjoyed the day. Um, so my name's Mark Scurrell. Uh, I'm a program manager. I'm based in uh, Redmond, uh, just outside of Seattle. Uh, I'm in the Azure Compute uh, product group. So our overall product group, we're responsible for pretty much the wider group, pretty much responsible for everything to do with uh, compute. So that can be uh, defining the new hardware that we're making available, uh, exposing that via VMs uh, and containers, and uh, then sort of having some of, sort of the higher level capabilities uh, built on top of uh, that. So things like uh, VM scale sets, uh, Azure Batch, uh, the container service, and so on. So it's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, in, uh, yesterday, I did an introductory session. I don't know if um, uh, anyone here came along to that, where I looked at uh, infrastructure as a service and really sort of how you know, mo most people get a start with the cloud with uh, you know, infrastructure and what we sort of call like lift and shifting applications uh, fr from on-premises uh, to the cloud. So when we looked at things like the uh, you know, fundamental infrastructure layer, things like storage and the networking, and sort of the basic virtual machine offering. So really in this session today, we're sort of really going up, up the stack and sort of really looking at some of the higher level um, application services, the high level capabilities that we're providing um, that sort of really should take you know, sort of productivity to the the next level and the ease of use to the next level and really um, uh, make it easier, make you more productive to develop applications uh, for, the, for the cloud. <clears throat> so, so I think the sort of first thing, if we look back, um, so if I think I go back maybe sort of 10, 15, 10, 12 years maybe, and you look at how um, you know, applications, how companies have moved, start making their, uh, some of their um, offerings available on the cloud. Uh, you know, sort of things have changed, uh, and cons I think customer expectations have changed in terms of you know, maybe initially, um, like a good few years back, you would have seen, hey, look, a website is down for uh, maybe midnight until 6 a.m. in the morning for maintenance, or Saturdays, you know, the, the website isn't available, again, sort of for, for, for maintenance or because there was some sort of issue. And sort of really that's changing now. I think customer expectations are changing in terms of um, the functionality that's available uh, to them, the speed of innovation where new features become available, problems get fixed, um, the, uh, where they can access these applications uh, on the PC, on, the, on their phone, uh, on the tablet, and so on. So sort of really the, uh, you know, customer expectations are sort of changing and sort of really with what we're sort of providing with these higher level platform services, it's sort of really to sort of to help developers to be able to cater for that, to be able to cater for the sort of fast rollout, uh, being able to develop for the cloud, uh, being able to uh, have a sort of this continuous cycle of uh, updates and, and deployments and, you know, upgrading. Uh, as well as being able to monitor and, and manage that. So just a sort of interesting look. As sort of you look at those sort of four pictures, and you sort of think to yourself, well, what have all these? What have these four got in common? And uh, I think it's sort of pretty pretty obvious. They're sort of all examples of either companies or industries that have sort of been disrupt been disrupted by uh, you know, some of these newer uh, cloud-first uh, companies. And really sort of what these companies have been doing is um, you know, building from the uh, ground up for the, for the cloud and really sort of leveraging sort of the new, the new capabilities and sort of the new characteristics of um, you know, the internet and the vastly improved uh, internet that's uh, available. Uh, so sort of leveraging effectively you're in the cloud, people can access your capabilities from, from anywhere. The fact that everyone pretty much has a smartphone now and can access, um, access your services or your applications, whether they're at home, whether they're on the road, whether they're at work. Um, you know, sort of really leveraging the speed as well, the speed of the connectivity, the bandwidth that's available, and to really sort of enable these sort of capabilities. 
I mean, it's actually pretty amazing. Actually, with obviously Microsoft owns Skype now. You know, just the quality that you can get with your sort of video calls, um, the fact that you can do uh, literally as you go, real like real time translation, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, amazing. I use uh, Uber all the time, for example. It's just uh, some of these uh, new, you know, born in the cloud services are just totally disruptive. And sort of the earlier point has sort of really changed uh, customer expectations. <clears throat> so this also has a, effectively the fallout on, you know, of the, the uh, existing companies. And really, you know, you look at these, it's just four examples of very big, very well-known known companies. And they're all sort of taking, like, looking at the cloud, looking at the sort of potential disruption that's there, and sort of really taking a cloud-first uh, view on some of their uh, offerings. And, you know, really, again, looking at what customers want, look at those customer expectations, and sort of really, you know, wanting to provide, um, you know, the sort of capabilities that people want now, uh, again, so that, you know, they don't get, don't get disrupted. Um, you know, so some of the capabilities that, um, you know, definitely uh, looked at and, and have been adopted really sort of across the board here, you know, certainly in recent times, it's sort of the, the big data, the analytics, the, uh, you know, IoT, deep learning, and, and, and so on. Uh, one thing that I, sort of particular area of interest to me was, you know, in addition to uh, Ford there, is, uh, you know, a number of the car companies, for example, are making available now smart apps, uh, smartphone apps for, for the car. Um, and uh, Tesla, in particular, um, has sort of really been, I think, innovative in terms of, you know, effectively every few months, you know, they're going to effectively upgrade the software in the car. Everything on the con car is controlled by software, and every few months you can get an update. And if you bought the car several years ago or just, just recently, you can get these, uh, these updates. And it just downloads overnight. And in the morning, you've got a new set of capabilities. I and mean, sort of really um, sort of amazing innovations, really. <clears throat> so how have um, uh, sort of like, people get, getting there, getting, getting to the cloud? And where did so we see, see things going? And in the session yesterday, as I said, I sort of talked about infrastructure as a service and sort of providing that initial um, uh, sort of almost like the easiest way into the cloud of taking your initial taking your existing applications and maybe moving them up to the cloud and allowing us to cater for things like that, you know, fundamental infrastructure. But they're the same applications. <clears throat> they're developed in the sort of with the same methodologies. Uh, but there's obviously a ton of... Uh, efficiency, a ton of value that you can get from, from doing that. You can get access to the, uh, some of the, the various, uh, the la actually very large range of hardware that we, that we have and that we're adding all the time. Uh, GPUs, for example, a very high performance SKUs, very good price performance uh, VMs, um, you know, a vast range of hardware. You can take advantage of the, uh, the elasticity, you know, the fact that you can, if you've got a dev test, for example, you can, um, you can spin up the VMs when you need them, and then you can take them down when you, when you don't need them and sort of really cater for the, um, really have that elasticity on your resources and, and pay for, for what you use. And then the scale as well. Uh, I think uh, I showed a brief demo yesterday. It sort of went up to 300 uh, VMs. I've done other demos and worked with customers where we've gone into the tens of thousands of VMs. And, you know, with the, with the, um, the cloud and sort of effectively the hyperscale that we have now and the global reach that we have, you know, there's really definitely new possibilities there in terms of uh, utilizing really, really large amounts of uh, compute. So I still have to step back sometimes. The group I'm in, we sort of focus on large scale compute and uh, I could be preparing for a demo or working with a customer on a proof of concept, for example. And literally with a command line, I can create a set of VMs and um, configure it, and literally five minutes later, I've got uh, 10,000 VMs uh, sitting there, you know, maybe 20,000, 30,000, or 40,000 cores, something like that. So literally in five to 10 minutes, I can get that much uh, compute power, uh, use it for 30 minutes, an hour, and then uh, again, run a command line and have it all go away, and then I start paying for it. So pretty amazing new things. So we think for the, in the cloud, we start off with uh, get that initial bump with uh, infrastructure as a service, get a whole bunch of value and efficiency there. 
but sort of really moving forward, what we're seeing is after that initial phase, um, get the initial applications up and running, but with the, um, maybe you're developing, enhancing those applications, maybe you're cr now creating some new applications, you'd be in the position to leverage what we call platform as a service and these higher level capabilities. <clears throat> so just to level set, I think it's sort of useful that the diagram on the right there is just, is, is useful, especially for those new to the, new to the cloud and we, have so much terminology, it's uh, amazing sometimes to, to think about that. Um, so sort of in a traditional on-premises um, offering, you know, obviously you're responsible for everything. You know, you own everything from that uh, foundational infrastructure, the servers and the storage and the networking and so on. You know, you might have a, you may or may not, you might have a virtualization layer, uh, pick your OS, uh, all the way up to your applications and, and data. And I think certainly when it comes to applications that you're writing or applications that you're running, I mean, the main thing, uh, and sort of bear this in mind going forward, that you're concerned about and really where you want to spend your time is in your sort of expertise um, with, and you know, business domain knowledge and so on, and it's the applications and the, and the data. So with uh, IaaS, you know, we move up and sort of take some of the foundational uh, uh, layers away from you, uh, so you don't have to worry about those, and that's the virtualization, storage, and, and networking, and the, all the servers, and so on, and that's where you can get your initial uh, lift and shift your applications and get some initial benefit, but you know, you still got, uh, you know, we've got our, our five layers at the top there, you still got that responsibility for um, maybe uh, looking after the OS, patching the OS, um, you know, middlewares, run times, and so on, as well as your applications and, and data. But, you know, there's a significant uh, value from uh, using infrastructure as a service and not having to worry about those bottom layers. So then with PaaS, what we're, what we're uh, going to touch on here and what you'll see is sort of we're really, um, I sort of think about it, so we're really sort of trying to take away um, tasks, uh, development effort, uh, uh, management effort that you sort of have to do, and you sort of have to do because you sort of always have to, say, manage the servers or manage these VMs. But really, at the end of the day, it's, I think it's all about, it's the, about the applications, it's about your data. And so sort of things that we don't really think are like core to your business or core to the applications, and in reality, we can abstract away. We can, we can do that by moving up the stack and providing you these higher level uh, capabilities. So one of the, sort of the main, I think, best examples is, uh, and we'll touch on it uh, with the demo, is uh, functions. And sort of functions is sort of our um, late, one of a pretty recent Azure offering, and it sort of builds on this sort of concept of serverless. So I think that's, you know, that's where, um, you know, you can run some code, and uh, you don't re actually really have to worry about the fact that whether there's actually physical servers or even whether there's VMs, uh, or you don't really have to worry about scaling them up or scaling them down and so on. Uh, we're really um, you know, providing this sort of serverless capability so you can focus on writing your code and running the code and managing it, but there's a whole set of, um, whole layer there that you don't have to worry about anymore. So that's just one, one example. And then obviously on the far right, we've got the software as a service, uh, your Office 365s, uh, Power BI, maybe, and, and, and so on there, where we sort of handle and provide you uh, everything. So hopefully that's just a, a good level set, especially if you're sort of starting, just starting to get into the, uh, the cloud and, and Azure. <clears throat> so we've, um, what we did in terms of um, looking at platform as a service and work, so we worked with some of the companies that have effectively moved from um, infrastructure as a service and have started leveraging uh, platform as a service. And it's definitely a trend we see. Uh, some of the early adopters of uh, Azure I think using the virtual machines um, and using that infrastructure. And you know, maybe they've been doing that for a couple of years, um, you know, one, two, three years, and really are sort of now looking at uh, platform as a service. And we've got a couple of examples here as, as well. Um, <clears throat> but what are the benefits of, of that? And this was, I mean, it's a, uh, I think it was about seven or eight uh, companies. We partnered with Forrester and they interviewed these companies just to try and get some a representative sample of companies that have invested in platform as a service and what sort of benefits did they, did they get. 
and uh, you know, pretty significant here in terms of the return on the in investment. Uh, and I think sort of the couple that stand out there, sort of time saved, uh, maybe that's time saved on managing, time saved on deployments and upgrades and so on, and uh, being able to um, iterate faster, get, get your software out uh, faster, more regularly, uh, maintaining uptime and, and so on there. <clears throat> All right, so let's just put this, uh, the platform services in context. What are they and how do they, f they, they fit in with the stack? Sort of talked about this a little bit, but the picture's always nice. Um, so we have our base layer, our infrastructure as a service, uh, VM storage networking, and uh, obviously, um, even in the last uh, year or so, a year or two, we've uh, invested heavily um, in containers as well. So we now have uh, the uh, Azure Container Service, uh, it was available uh, G8 uh, last year. And then uh, even now, you might have um, seen in, I think, Windows Server 2016, we actually have built-in Docker container support for uh, Windows Server as well. So really recognizing the uh, value that containers bring. So we've got that in terms of uh, infrastructure. And then we've got a, a number of offerings on top, on top of that. So if you're at the, uh, the keynote, uh, I think it was Jeff went through the portal and he was scroll scrolling through um, all, the th all the things that were available at a session yesterday at a big chart, eye chart with uh, everything. And uh, so you can see we do have uh, lots of offerings, um, you know, catered at various scenarios, um, various types of applications. Um, <clears throat> so let's, let's start off on the left-hand side. So app services. We've done some, those that have been following Azure, we've done a little bit of uh, probably rebranding last year on this. And this is really, it's really sort of an umbrella um, service for, um, you know, a number of actual services there, which is web, mobile, API, and, and logic apps. So we've effectively, there's four real Azure services there, all sort of under the umbrella of these uh, app services. And again, just for those that are, um, uh, have been following Azure, so there's some of the name change. I think uh, web service, which used to be uh, websites, Azure websites. It was one of our first higher level platform platform services. Um, and then Logic Apps is, and API is, uh, they're sort of a couple of the newer ones. We've got Service Fabric. Uh, I had a, uh, gave a brief intro, or gave a session which introdu introduced Service Fabric yesterday. And really sort of this, uh, there's a little bit at the end of this, we'll, we'll dig into it a little, but Service Fabric sort of allows you, basically provides both a developer platform to allow you to sort of build uh, applications based on microservices and deploy them at scale, robustly, in, in, actually in the cloud, also on premises or even you know, on a local machine, um, but have, a, have an overall cluster of machines, cluster of nodes where you can deploy your microservices and um, provide the developers the tools to develop, and uh, administrators in IT the tools to be able to monitor and manage and um, monitor and manage the applications in the clusters. Functions, uh, we'll, we'll dig into that. I've got some sp a specific demo there. Uh, in terms of functions, I, as I said earlier, it's sort of really a, a fairly new service, but sort of really it's all about uh, serverless compute. And effectively, you know, you can write your code um, these, these sort of effectively functions or these snippets of code uh, perform a particular task, uh, and you don't have to worry about uh, you know VMs or servers where where they run. We sort of handle that, and as we'll see, there's definitely a and there's a different uh, business model that can come along with this if you don't have to worry about the uh, the VMs. Event driven as well, as we'll see, uh, can be very uh, event driven, both sort of for functions actually and, and logic apps as well. Uh, so you can have uh, very easily create event driven uh, applications. Cloud services for those that aren't Azure, they're actually they were our very first offering. We actually built some platform as a service capabilities even before our VMs were available. Uh, so still extremely popular. Um, really sort of way that sort of builds a layer on top of our virtual machines, makes it easier to manage groups of machines, separate out your roles in a multi-tier application. Uh, you can have these uh, services talk to each other as well, and we'll do things like it makes it easier to scale up and down, um, you know, some of the uh, roles within your multi-tier tier application. So that's probably the, uh, one of the longest running serv platform services that we've, uh, we've, we've had there and extremely popular. 
And then also, the, you know, if um, I showed yesterday the Azure Marketplace, we go to azure.com and go to the Marketplace, or you're in the portal and you say new, uh, you can go to the Marketplace and browse many applications, the OS images and, and so on there, but including, you know, third-party uh, platform as a service offerings. So sort of vast range there. I mean, I think the, one of the challenges that we hear all the time, we're producing so many, the, a lot of these services, uh, maybe in the, even in the last year, you know, you sort of do have to keep, keep checking back on Azure.com, keep following the blogs and so on, because, you know, from your perspective, you know, there is so much, uh, there's so much there, and literally we're sort of iterating uh, there's updates, uh, new features almost like every week, and new services every few weeks even, or every, every month or so. So um, definitely things are moving fast. There we go. So yeah, web and mobile microservices, uh, functions definitely on the serverless side, um, and so on there. All right, so app service. <clears throat> So with App Service, and this sort of really um, talked about this for Azure as a whole, but really when we've got, we've, we've got these higher level app services, you know, we've really still got to bear in mind some sort of key principles or really sort of get some key um, fundamentals uh, right for you. Um, yes, yeah, so they've got to be easier to build, maybe easier to manage, quicker to deploy, and, and so on. But you know, you're still running your business. They still need to be enterprise-grade uh, applications. You still need to be running on our sort of enterprise-grade uh, infrastructure. Uh, we really want to be able to um, you know, improve the efficiency uh, for how you manage these applications and really you know, put a lot of effort uh, into making it as easy and as quick as possible and as low overhead as possible to sort of manage the applications or on the IT side. And then from the development side, you know, maybe um, uh, service fabric or some of the, uh, uh, the functions and so on uh, really sort of enable the developer get the high producti productivity development. Some sort of specific examples there, um, you know, for enterprise uh, grade. Uh, Jason covered a bunch of this in the, in the keynote. Uh, definitely a lot of emphasis, you know, on the platform as a whole around security and compliance. Uh, catering for hybrid, uh, hybrid scenarios, and for example, the AAD, Active Directory AAD integration there, and really having that global footprint, the ability you can write, write these applications, you can deploy these services. Uh, we'll see it uh, in, the, in the demos, you know, around the world in our 36 regions. <clears throat> um, the fully managed, we sort of touched a bit on that, um, actually towards maybe the, the serverless, you know, I think the one thing there that we'll see for, for some of these services that we'll look at is effectively the built-in auto scale. Um, you know, uh, like if we move up the stack, we have our VMs, and then we have things like virtual machine scale sets and Azure Batch, which are very good at um, provisioning and making it e much, much easier for you to get large numbers of, of VMs uh, to cater for large-scale workloads. And then we have things like the auto scale auto scale uh, service that allows you to scale the number of those VMs up and down according to load. On some of these services that we've got here, you don't even have to worry about that. The service will look at you know, the incoming load, is it keeping up, and uh, ensure that the appropriate amount of resource is there for you. <clears throat> and then we talked about the development. I think the thing on the development, maybe two things there uh, to highlight. Um, really is the choice, uh, the choice of your development framework, the tools, um, the sort of the technologies that you use. Um, you know, as you see, sort of like even all our, all our APIs, for example, for the service I, I work on most of the time, uh, you know, we have obviously .NET and C Sharp, um, .NET Core, so that could run on, on uh, Linux, but we have Java, Node, Python, and, and so on there. So even, you know, all the APIs for these services, uh, you know, you pick, pick the API, pick the language that you, you want to use. Uh, and then the staging and deployment, I think, is uh, interesting as well, sort of being able to uh, cater for sort of more of this continuous development cycle, being able to develop these applications, maybe push them out to a st sort of staging, and then push them out to production and, you know, basically loop around, keep going. All right, so let's dig in to the app service initially. Um, so this, as I said, really an umbrella for sort of four services here. 
we'll talk about the, so the first one was the um, web apps. And as I said, this used to be called websites, and I think it was one of our first uh, platform services. And this was really all about, uh, you could use, for example, our worker role offering, um, worker role and actually web role offering, I mean, um, and have websites, but you, you know, you were still dealing with virtual machines, you still basically had IIS running on these machines. We provide a, a bunch of help to make that easier to manage and deploy and so on, but really websites came out which abstracted a whole lot more uh, things away from you, made it a lot quicker to um, provision and de deploy your websites, have them automatically scale for you, um, and, and so on there. So yeah, definitely the order scale, the load balancing there, and then tying it in with the sort of continuous deployment. Um, I think all our, uh, a lot of Azure.com is based on um, you know, the, the web apps. And um, you know, we have this sort of continuous deployment cycle where literally, actually, you can go in and even contribute to the documentation. We can go in internally. Anyone on the, on the team can go in and contribute the, the, uh, the documentation, go into Git, make the change, propose the change, submit it. Uh, it then is part of a workflow. It'll get approved, and then it's sort of just pushed out to the, out to the site. So even you know, internally on our documentation, you'll have seen that you know, you can, we use uh, GitHub and pretty much anyone can contribute and get changes in and improve the uh, documentation. And all that's sort of based on integration with uh, web apps. Mobile apps followed uh, soon after. I think I want to say maybe that's about four or five years uh, that that has been around. And I think sort of the, the main thing here was to recognize, obviously we've got um, mobile, uh, certainly four or five years ago, you know, rapidly uh, increasing uh, trend, rapid uh, adoption of mobile, and make, we, people wanting to make their experiences available on, on devices. But you know, it was pretty, uh, it could be pretty tricky, pretty involved to cater for all these devices and effectively write the backend services to support, to support these devices. So really mobile apps um, I say, I think maybe about four, three or four years ago, uh, came about really to sort of solve that problem, provide those high level capabilities so that um, make it quicker and easier to uh, deploy these services um, for the you know, many, many uh, device types to be able to connect to. Uh, and when, you know, whether it's le leveraging, um, often I think we started off with uh, database, you know, backed by databases, internal APIs, and, and so on there. So initially, I think we focused on the auth it was the authentication and push notifications. One area I've actually worked on is offline sync as well, and they've added some, you know, added some really nice features there for, where you, for the developer so that when you know, their users haven't got connectivity but you still want to give them access to a certain amount of data, then there's offline sync capabilities built in. And you're not having to write that yourself. Actually, I think it's a great example of having uh, written some of this stuff of you know, really helping uh, product de developer productivity and the fact that pretty much out of the box uh, you get effectively offline sync capabilities for, for data sets that you define. Um, so you can have uh, data cached on the phone. The end user, even without connectivity, can update that. And then when they get the connectivity, they, it'll, it'll sync for you. So great platform. I think that combines as well with what Jason was talking about in terms of obviously then we have the um, you know, Xamarin uh, integration with Visual Studio. To, so now you've got the tools to be able to develop the front ends as well, more easily develop the front end for all the device types, as well as the service to, for, the, for the, um, you know, the back end service. API apps, uh, a bit more, more recent. That's all about really exposing the data that you have and exposing it in a sort of consistent, sort of standard way so that then that could be consumed, again, maybe by, um, by uh, mobile apps or, or web apps um, or can actually be surfaced in, uh, we'll go into the uh, logic apps in, in a minute. But really sort of all about, um, you've got all this data in, internally and you want to make it available uh, to people with devices or um, you know, other applications outside the enterprise, but you, you need to make it available in a sort of standard way and in a secure way and uh, be able to easily manage that. So uh, that's what API apps is all about. And then finally, logic apps. So this is pretty much in chronological order there. Uh, logic apps is really uh, takes things almost like to the next level. And it's also really, will, and I've got a demo here, it's already all about 
uh, building integrated solutions, your various services, they could be your own services, uh, could be API apps that you've exposed, there could be third party uh, capabilities that, that effectively um, the APIs have been exposed and allows you to sort of integrate these various services uh, together with uh, workflow. So there's a large like, ecosystem and definitely growing ecosystem of um, these connectors that we offer from all the, you know, our Microsoft services, Office 365 and so on, but uh, external uh, SharePoints there, uh, Outlook uh, and so on, but also the third party uh, services with uh, like Dropbox, Twitter, Salesforce and, and so on there. And the very cool thing, I'll touch on this a little, but the cool thing about this with Logic Apps is then you can also call out to, um, and actually with functions as well, we sort of call out and leverage these other services that we've made available. And certainly at the moment, like things like cognitive services and machine learning, so powerful to be able to effectively write effectively your web API call in there in your Logic App uh, or, your, or your function and basically say, hey, call off and um, do some image recognition or do some smart thumbnail generation according to you know, where they're the uh, person is in the picture, do face detection and so on. And you can just do that by calling out to a web service now. <clears throat> okay, let's uh, do a demo. The th one thing I wanted to show you, uh, where are we? All right. <clears throat> Was, I just want to click on this link. I'm really only able to hopefully get across to you sort of the range of things that we have available with our app services and sort of touch on, uh, so you know, what, what they do at a high level, are they suitable, you know, is it something that you want to look further, further at? And you know, maybe your next thing is you get back to the office the next week and say, well, I'd like to dig into that particular service or that service. So just one thing I want to highlight, um, and the, the teams I think have done this pretty nice capability that I think we'll start, start seeing more, um, more frequently is basically these try capabilities. So even if you haven't got an Azure account, you haven't got a subscription, you haven't even done the, the, the free account, you can go and play with these app services. <clears throat> There's a little intro video here. Um, you can select the app type. So as I was talking about uh, mobile there, for example. Um, you can say hit next. Maybe it's Xamarin Simral. There's an example with a field en engineer. We're going to build a mobile dashboard here. So you could select that um, and then create. And what it does, it just basically creates a sandbox for you behind the scenes, sort of like effectively we've provisioned whatever, whatever is required there. I think it lasts an hour or so, something like that. So you can keep you know, creating them. But you can have a play with literally no commitment, no credit card, no free trial or anything like that. So anything that you, know, you see here, you want to um, try out for app services, do use this. I think it's a great intro. And then you can, if you really, okay, well, this definitely looks like something that we could use. Uh, you could use a free trial and really start using the, um, the service sort of properly for, you know, over, over a number of days or a number of weeks. So I just thought I'd highlight that, tryappservice.azure.com. All right. <clears throat> so on Logic Apps, so I'm going to go into the um, portal. So hopefully everyone's seen the portal. Well, I was in the keynote. Everyone's seen the portal by now. Um, I've got my dashboard for the Tech Summit. And uh, I've got my list of my favorite services here. This is what uh, Jeff was, was showing. Um, and just to, I went through this at one of the other sessions. Um, the, here's the big list he was going through. And this sort of um, the, it gives you a, I keep scrolling and scrolling. There we go. Uh, the, the amount of stuff that is there and is available to use in Azure, it's nicely categorized and so on. But obviously, no one's going to be using all of this all the time. So there is the way, you know, you, you basically just come up with your favorites and then you sort of tick something with favorites and then it appears on the left-hand side here. Uh, so that's basically what I've, what I've done here. Uh, so Logic Apps. So I've added Logic Apps uh, here. We can click on that. So I've got a demo, I've got a pre-created one, but what I'm gonna do, we'll uh, keep the fingers crossed for the network and everything, we'll uh, actually do an, a new Logic App. <clears throat> uh, okay, 
So I just need to name it, come up with a unique name for the Logic App. I've got a concept of a subscription. Uh, I talked about this before, but just very briefly, this if you have an Azure account, you can have multiple subscriptions, and that's where there's a bunch of configuration, like quotas can roll up to a, be associated with the subscription, but also it's a way to sort of billing is rolled up. So when you get your bill, it's broken out per subscription. So you can have the subscriptions for different departments, for example, individuals, and so on. We've got a uh, resource group. Um, uh, so a resource group is a, goes beneath a subscription. A subscription can have a, uh, multiple resource groups. And really, as really the name implies, for the, all the resources you could create, you can group them into one, again, effectively container and uh, really sort of helps in uh, management. And I think actually you can roll it, uh, drill down into the billing as well for sort of the, what, what are the charges associated with a particular resource group. So it's sort of good for, you know, maybe a particular application or set of applications. Uh, you can create a resource group for those. Um, definitely a first class, it's really a sort of a first class, pretty much in all the experiences within Azure where you're creating resources, you're gonna be um, uh, creating or using existing resource groups. Here's my location. I've got it set by default to North Central US, but just, again, for those sort of new um, to Azure, this just gives you the, the flavor. You can see here on the pull-down, um, Logic Apps, about, you know, wh where is it available? Uh, some of the services, it does vary. Uh, there's a, um, if you go to our regions, and then you can say for the regions um, what services are available where. Some of them actually do, do uh, vary. Maybe they start off in a few regions, and then they'll expand out later on. Uh, Logic Apps, obviously, is pretty much everywhere here. <clears throat> uh, one other thing on the, the billing, it, it depends on the service again, but things like for VMs, um, if you, you check the pricing, sort of the pricing can vary between regions. It's sort of, sort of based on the demand and sort of some of the costs and so on, but you know, there might be slight differences in VM cost, for example, between the, between the regions. So just something to consider. All right, let's create that. <clears throat> so it's a pretty simple experience, certainly when you're creating a VM or other things, there's two, three or four maybe areas to go through. Uh, that is deploying. It looks like that succeeded. Uh, I've got my little notification up here. I click on that, and that uh, says it succeeded. It's sometimes when you're using the portals, sometimes it's not so good about automatically refreshing, but it pretty much always has a refresh there. So if you're not sure, just click on the refresh and um, you get the latest and greatest list. <clears throat> Looks like I created those exactly the same name. All right, so let's uh, select that. Ah, that must have been my existing one. Maybe this one. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So. I created this, obviously I haven't, I've just literally created the Logic App, there's nothing effectively in it yet. And uh, again, a fairly consistent experience, if I scroll off to the right here, it's gone in and invoked the UI, I've got all my options here on the left, I've got my summary here in the, in the middle. And then on the right hand side, it's like automatically put me into what, what's the, called the designer. And uh, again, helping me here with a set of templates. So hopefully this, if we just, look through the sort of templates. This starts to give you a flavor of what I was talking about in terms of integrating services, whether from Microsoft or elsewhere. Um, and this sort of gives you a sort of a flavor of some of the like processes or integration uh, that you can perform. So uh, this is sort of Microsoft only here. You know, send an email when something's new items added to a uh, SharePoint online list. Um, this is totally third party, share tweets on Facebook. Uh, you know, and then a, a mixture. Um, here we go. New member added to MailChimp, then uh, add them to a SharePoint list. So a whole bunch of sort of starting points here. Uh, this might be useful, new file in, in Dropbox, and then also copy it to, to SharePoint. So if I just select one of these, it's going to say, hey, look, uh, what, what is it? Um, gives you sort of a, the high-level flow, and then you can say, uh, use the template, and it'll start you off on, a, on the process here. So um, for some of the third-party services, well, for most of these services, obviously there's authentication required and, you, and you're gonna have to sign in. I'm gonna leave that for the moment, though, and I'm gonna create one of my own. 
Um, okay, so effectively I've canceled out of that and I'm in the designer now. Um, actually, let me just even, let me maximize that for you. <clears throat> so I've got my over, overview, as I said, with sort of blank here. In my development tools, I have the designer. <clears throat> so let me select that. There's my templates. Actually, let me just select that as well. This will just bring, take me off to web page. So again, just to give you, this is an ever-increasing list. Looks like it was updated uh, about maybe a month ago. But this, again, sort of just gives you a flavor of the number of connectors, the number of services that you can, um, you can talk to. And for a number of these, you know, there's a further drill down description of how to do it, as well as, you know, various integrations. So again, just to give you sort of a breadth. So I'm going to start with a blank logic app, just to show you something from scratch. <clears throat> So uh, the scenario I thought would be um, sort of fairly quick to do uh, is uh, we'll sort of just do a test for a particular web service, um, actually a web API, web API availability. <clears throat> and I'm just going to bring in a couple, of, a couple of services. So the first thing I'm going to do is I need a recurrence. Like every hour, for ex effectively, I'm going to run a query on this web API and uh, see has it come back successfully or not. So I'm set up a recurrence. So when we go in here, you know, you'll see this is a common. You get basically the step here. This is a recurrence step. Um, there's more information here about, about it. You can rename it. You can add a comment. You can delete it. You can get a little bit more of a description about it. And then uh, here, the basic information, um, I can uh, let's see here. Set up a, I'm going to, every 60 minutes, uh, so this effectively is going to be an event, and it's going to fire every 60 minutes. Most of these uh, steps will have advanced options. Uh, it's sort of hidden by default, but you can go in here. For example, you can uh, specify time zones or particular start times and so on. So then I'm going to go on. Now I can create a new step, and this will sort of be, be linked. So the next thing I'm going to do, I want to make a call off to the, the web API. And Mr. nice and conveniently at the top here, I've got an HTTP uh, action. <clears throat> So here, the first thing I've got, uh, obviously, custom set of fields, uh, you know, obviously, a very specific to the HTTP action. And I'm going to perform a get, and I need a URI. So just to save me typing, uh, I've got that here. So I'm making a, cross, uh, uh, I'm going to make a call off to this third-party API and do a query against this endpoint search JSON for uh, Seattle. You can see I can add uh, headers, uh, I can add body to this, and then there's sort of more uh, advanced options, for example, authentication. But I don't need any of that. I'm going to just uh, make that call. Hopefully, I'm sorry, I'm not being very good here in terms of the uh, zoom, so hopefully you can still see towards the back, whoa, there, the recurrence, the HTTP, and what I filled in there. All right, so then new step, and I'm going to add a condition. So I've made my HTTP call. Uh, I want to perform different actions sort of depending on what the result was. It might have succeeded, it might fail. So I'm going to add a, con a condition. <clears throat> and uh, what I want to condition on, so one of the things that it's really sort of nice here, it's basically saying, look, um, your previous step was HTTP. You could have a condition based on what that action returns. And then we know that you know, one of the things, obviously, for an HTTP call is the uh, status code. So I'm going to say, look, I'm going to have a condition. So basically, if the status code is equal to, and then, then I'm going to just put in the value of, of 200 so it succeeds, then I want to do something. So you can see here, if yes, and currently it's not doing anything. So in here, I'm going to add an action. So if that succeeded, and perform an action. So the thing I was just doing here, just and it's a, it's a little fake, but um, it was just easy sort of to, for the for the particular demo here, is um, I'm going to call off to OneDrive and I'm going to create some information uh, actually in my OneDrive account to, for whether that succeeded or failed, and actually I'm going to create a file. So what this is going to do is show you. I, first of all, I can search here, search in the actions. I found OneDrive. Uh, I can create a file. Uh, there'll be more information available on this. It's pretty obvious, I suppose. 
Um, and here I get prompted. So this is where I sign in. <clears throat> so it takes me off, does a redirect. Sign in. Yeah, so the question is that account going you using forward. What we'll see, um, remind me if I don't uh, look at this later, but that's, that'll have filled that in, and that'll be available and saved in these API connections. So it securely saves everything off, and then it would be available. If I want to use that account further on in the workflow, I can do that. So the thing I'm going to do is create an account, and now it's linked it. I can, I can click on here and, uh, you know, browse, browse through that. Uh, again, I've got my... It's just going to do, I never remember the name, so I'm just going to use that one. Uh, so I'm going to create a file. I'm going to create it in that folder. Um, I'm in the success path, I think, here. Yeah, if yes, then um, I can create success.txt. Um, and I can also, I can, um, the file content, uh, what am I going to put in the file? I know it was a success, but I'm going to put it in the, um, the body of the file, just so I could actually see if I want to, I could see uh, what was returned. So here's an example. So on the no case, if it, if it fails, again, I can add the action. I can do the OneDrive. Oops. Create file. Uh, have I still got that? Yes, I do. So I'm creating the same uh, folder. Um, say that failed, and then the content here, uh, I don't know what the status code be, so I'm going to put the status code, and then I'm going to put the body. <clears throat> so that is, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, I think, my initial um, uh, logic app, and I can save that. So let's just go through, uh, I think, yeah, API connections. If I jump to here, the API connections, you can see I've got my sort of OneDrive connection here, and it's saved off. So let's go back to the designer, though. <clears throat> and uh, just up at the top here, we've got various options. I'm going to hit the run, and we'll try this out. So it just takes a second or two, and um, I don't know, I, I worked on the... Uh, SQL Server team for quite a while. This sort of has a lot of sort of flashbacks for me for integration services, for example, that experience. Uh, so I can see the, the various actions. I can see they've run here. Uh, they've all succeeded. It's gone through. And um, it's gone through in the yes condition and, and in theory created the file. I messed up here. Actually, you can see here maybe in the, the preview there actually wasn't a file there. And uh, if I go there, uh, I've, I've got success. Let's click on that. At least we can, we can see that you can see the uh, error one getting created. <clears throat> so this is the information that's returned by that uh, by that API. All right. <clears throat> so on the uh, let's just check the the no works. And this was interesting for me. Um, I went through and I couldn't get the uh, the no to fire, and uh, looked at the documentation and so on. Got a refresher. And I need to sort of expand something that doesn't look like it's supported in the UI at the moment. So I thought it'd be a good example where I can show you the, we've got in the designer view here, but there was also the code view. So the thing I can do is go in. And so, you know, here we can see what's the, effectively the quotes, the code behind this. And pretty much like everything today, um, you know, you've got the, sort of this declarative um, code here. And you sort of see the, as it goes from the, the bottoms up, so we can start off with our recurrence, and then we've got our HTTP, and then uh, after the HTTP, if it's succeeded, we've got the, um, the action to create the file, whether it's succeeded or not. So all of that information, the UI basically creates this, um, this file here, and you can access it directly. So the thing I noticed, um, what I needed to get this uh, running was, Actually, here on the run after HTTP succeeded, and what I need is uh, let me just yeah, let me save that. Let's put in a failed for that. <clears throat> so the 
the behavior is, it actually says, well, this thing failed and it actually doesn't go on. So um, uh, it's set up by default with that and that's the UI behavior. So I want it to go on and check the condition even if the HTTP failed. So I can do that, I can go into the designer, look, look it up in the documentation, put this in, uh, save it. Uh, I can still go back to the designer uh, and then we can, so we need to run this, but obviously I need to make it fail. So it's the easiest way I thought to do that was, I went to the web API here, I just put a, a Z on the end, so that should be uh, invalid. Let's save that and run. <clears throat> So there we go. So we got our HTTP uh, has failed. The condition has run, and then my no, uh, the yes hasn't run, and the no has. <clears throat> Just in, in terms of the information that's provided in here, I know, okay, this failed, or even if it succeeded, I can go into it and dig into it and say, and it, it gives me the, the, the breakdown of the information. Look, it wasn't found. Um, here was your input on the get. We got the uh, search JSON with a Z, and here was the output that was um, here was the output that was returned, including the uh, headers and the body. So you can always sort of drill down and effectively get that debug information. Uh, we can see the no has fired, and then uh, if we're here now, we've got an error dot text <coughs> uh, that it's put there, and we can again see what we saw in the UI there. Hopefully, in terms of the the error, so you know not found. Uh, and there's the sort of the, the issue there that wasn't found on the server. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that gives you, uh, you know, at least, at least a favor, it's sort of a little bit of a contrived example, but it, you know, effectively pinging a website and so on uh, for the availability, you know, I could have changed this maybe to uh, send, send an email, uh, call a web hook, that sort of thing. It'd be something you want to do, and you know, literally within a few minutes, I've been able to tie in a couple of systems, I've been on the HTTP calls, um, make a OneDrive call, um, and so on there. Um, I think the, the other thing actually on the Logic app as well is then, um, to what I said, I haven't worried about the resources here. It's sort of effectively it's serverless. I don't know where it's run on what the resource and so on. I don't have to worry about scaling it and so on. So, um, you know, one of the, the other impacts of that or the changes to bear in mind for that is that there is a different business, effectively business model associated with that. So there's no like core hours anymore or paying for different VM sizes. You literally, um, here I think it's pay for number of um, execution, the number of times things uh, execute. So uh, let me just show you as well the way you can um, do this. If you go in the, um, <clears throat> the documentation and pricing, you can sort of see <clears throat> for the various uh, services, um, functions, we've got, there we go, logic apps, web and mobile, and you can get all the pricing details here. So you can see basically it's priced actions executed per month and how much, effectively how much you pay per action. And obviously the more that you do, you do a hundred million plus, then uh, you're paying uh, you know, that tiny amount for the, uh, each, each action. So then there's some examples there. So um, anyway, you can, you can read all that. But for all the services, all the Azure services, uh, you hear you can go into the pricing details. But it's, it is interesting for these, um, higher level capabilities that are serverless that you, know, you do start then having a separate um, you know, a billing model or a business model you're maybe not as familiar with compared to say something like uh, core hours or uh, gigabytes spa of space used on storage, that sort of thing. All right, I think that was that. <clears throat> 17, I should speed this up. So in terms of app services in general, I think just one key point to highlight is the, um, is sort of the integration. You know, you can use these high level capabilities, but you can still work effectively with the Azure ecosystem and the other capabilities here. We've got an example coming up with the, the Met Office. You can sort of still have that integration with a bunch of devices, maybe going through Traffic Manager. Um, you can still have your continuous integration, pushing code in or code, uh, updating code into sort of the, the app services. You can still have these services, leveraging SQL, uh, leveraging blob storage, and, and so on there. So you know you have got still sort of full integration with the Azure ecosystem. Uh, one example that we sort of highlight here, a company, a pretty big organization that's uh, leveraged uh, app services is the, is the Met Office. Um, 
just very quickly, um, you know, they had this sort of goal as UK weather service, but they had the goal to become really the world's largest uh, data, data platform for weather, for weather data. So they've used Azure to be able to sort of really almost like crowdsource um, a bunch of observations um, as well as some of like their official monitoring as well and then expose that to every, anyone on you know, whatever device, whether it's you know, web browser or um, phone or whatever there. And really wanted to provide a platform that they could you know, make available to other weather providers around the world. So it's pretty cool uh, to, to go through this. Um, oh, where this will pop up. Here we go. Let me just get out of so you can see it. I won't go into this in detail. We're running a little tight. But anyway, this, if you go to, it's pretty fun to play with it. Actually, just noticed uh, last time, that since last time, they've got a bunch of uh, observations there. But obviously, they were focused in, um, in the UK. So we can start it off in the UK. So you can drill down here. And really, as I said, there's some, some formal observations of this platform to get observations from some of their existing um, weather stations, but also crowdsource this and allow you know, schools, organizations, individuals to contribute. So you, you, know, you can click on a sample. You know, this is the latest uh, uh, sample. Um, you can click on get the full observation. So that's there. You can get the... Um, Actually, if we pull on the graph, you can get some of the history. This is defaults to the last day, so you see how the temperatures changed. And then one of the things, and it, it sort of comes in when we look at the architecture, is the um, allows people to uh, submit, you know, the photos. So you know, from that location, so we know. Oops, I, I moved the location there, but you know, for wherever the, the uh, for the location, you, you'll know where the photos, and you can see sort of different weather patterns and so on. Very very cool service, and it's sort of built on. Um, uh, the app services. <clears throat> so really, let me just build that out. Sort of this thing is sort of really, so this is sort of their architecture and sort of the, the uh, workflow for submitting data. So an end user can come in uh, with a phone, uh, can submit some measurements, and actually can submit some pictures. Uh, as well as weather stations. The pictures was interesting because they want to, obviously people could upload everything and then they're publishing the pictures so they want to check the pictures as best they can before they publish them. And that's a great example of where cognitive services is, is being used. So we have um, this uh, set of services um, called cognitive services and it can do things like you know, look at images, do uh, optical character recognition, um, facial recognition, face detection and so on there. So they literally use app services to make a call out to the cognitive services to effectively validate these pictures and are they suitable or not. And use SQL and then uh, put the pictures in blob storage, I think, there. So you can see the vast range of uh, capabilities there uh, and still using um, uh, the API apps, but still also using things like table storage, uh, Azure SQL, Elasticsearch, and so on. And then on the user query, um, uh, you know, they've done a lot of work to cater for you know, massive scale on those, on those the user query, whether from the web, whether from mobile apps. So going through web apps, um, and that's scaling out using API management. There's a caching layer there with Redis and so on. And a lot, then the actual data persisted there on a combination of SQL and table storage and then using Elasticsearch. So pretty sophisticated uh, architecture. Um, but all sort of using these higher level platform services. And this sort of just talks a little bit about the scale that they've been able to achieve. So again, some of the, some of the value around the scale, sort of the faster time to market, uh, the support, and really sort of the continuous integration as well on the, on the development side. So that's... <clears throat> so I want to move on to functions. We sort of have 10 minutes left here. Um, look at functions. So this is, again, another fairly new capability. Uh, I think it was sort of just towards the end of last year. It went GA in uh, November. And this is sort of really our offering for serverless uh, compute. And actually, we'll sort of see this, um, effectively artifacts of this, but anyone that was familiar with uh, websites or the web apps and maybe used web jobs, sort of functions is sort of built on some of that underlying uh, technology. So sort of a typical uh, example here would be a um, mobile backend. So you get a, f a photo taken. 
uh, webhook gets in, uh, called, uh, and then basically that photo gets put into uh, blob storage. <clears throat> and then, you know, it'd be pretty common for a num number of these applications that you want to produce variations of that image for various thumbnails or various different size pictures that appear in different parts of the uh, website. So that's a, like a perfect example for, and I'll show it uh, in a second, of, uh, of functions. So the sort of main characteristics there, I've uh, talked about serverless quite a bit, uh, and the event-driven nature. You know, an, an image just has to appear, or a blob just has to appear in storage, and that's detected, and then effectively your function can get called via, via a particular event. Um, you know, you've got your choice on languages, as we've seen in a num number, number of offerings, um, and then you've got the ability to use various services, both the sort of the built-in Azure services, um, things like uh, OneDrive, as well as third-party services like Box and Dropbox. <clears throat> All right, so let's have a look at functions. So we've got three, um, three examples. So we'll start off in the, in the portal again. <clears throat> so functions, it's actually in uh, part of app services. Uh, so we, so let me just go back. Uh, yeah. So we've got app services there uh, on the left-hand side. Click onto that, and so I've, so I've basically got my effectively function app created. Um, you can add other services here, and this is my, my function app. So when I select that, basically what that's going to do is, um, so for functions, I can have you know, one or more functions. It's going to query the functions I've got. Uh, I should list them out on the left-hand side there. And then I can also create any number of, uh, of, of new functions. Uh, it just takes a few seconds just to load those up. Um, <clears throat> so on the left-hand side, I've got three functions we're just briefly going to go through here. And I've got the ability to sort of create uh, a new function as well. Um, there's obviously help here. You know, we see a lot of this actually sort of across a number of services where we're sort of trying to make it as easy as possible just to get your way into and start playing with and learning the, the service. So this is pretty similar to the try experience. Hey, just get started. What are you thinking of doing? Uh, pick your language and create the function. <clears throat> so I'm going to start off with... Um, uh, I'll just go through these three. I'd sort of pre-created and sort of go up in... Um, and uh, sort of different, different characteristics and certain di different complexity. So this HTTP trigger here is almost like the hello world of uh, functions. And so we can see it's written in JavaScript. Uh, some of the later ones, I think these two are written in uh, C Sharp. And we've got the function body here. So this is going to get invoked. Here's the function URL. Uh, and whenever that gets invoked, it can get triggered. Whenever it gets in triggered, it's going to look at the request and it's going to look for um, you know, a query parameter or something in the body for the uh, name, the name parameter. And it's going to either respond, if that exists, it's going to say hello, or it's going to say, please uh, pass a name to this. So obviously, this is, as I say, just really almost like the hello, hello world of a, of a JavaScript uh, function. So then, and you can even author it here. There's this the editor here, the authoring environment. And then, you know, once you've written that, or I've just got that here, I can actually test it here as well um, because it's JavaScript. Um, so I can pull in the test section here, click, just click on the test in the top right, <clears throat> and it defaults to, um, you know, post. I've got my code and my, um, the code here that I need to access that. And then I've got the body, and here, uh, I was playing around with this, so I've got name, but I've misspelt it, so, um, and, and with the value of Azure. So I can uh, run that. I should be able to run that. Uh, you can see the logs at the, at the bottom, and we can see that the, uh, you can, if I zoom in, uh, you can see the function started there. Um, the JavaScript was processed, and then it sort of completed a fraction of a second later. And then at the bottom, we see that is executed, and it's gone through that code path. So if I uh, just correct that, I don't think I need to do anything else. Oh, I probably shouldn't have an Always note to self, always close down Skype. <laughs> um, I've corrected that. 
request, and I can um, just quickly run that again. And you can see at the bottom there, uh, that succeeded 200 OK, uh, Hello Azure. So very simple sort of Hello World example, but hopefully gives you the, you know, you can just run this. And again, I haven't worried about, about VMs and where it runs and so on. Uh, one example, I won't run this, just an example. It's similar to the weather, uh, the weather example. Uh, first of all, this sort of shows you some C Sharp and what that looks like. Uh, it shows you bringing in external libraries like Newtonsoft JSON. Uh, this is using storage, table storage, um, and so on here. And then when the task runs, this is an example of uh, calling an external service. This is a cognitive services, and it's calling a vision API. And uh, if we go through and what that looks like, uh, I, haven't, I hadn't set this up, but um, you, know, you can go and call it and pass it an image, and it'll go and detect the faces on that image and give you rectangles for where the faces are. So you know, literally, with a simple few lines of code and a, a web call, you can actually do that on, a, on an image. And then um, this will produce, uh, effectively, the output image with the uh, faces, rectangular images around the, around the faces. So um, again, very cool. And you can see you know, there's not too much uh, code here, and this can be, be run. The last thing that I'll show you is the resizer. So this is the thumbnail example. So we're going to do a, a resize. So you get an input image, and we're going to produce a, uh, a small uh, output and a medium size output. And uh, we're going to integrate this with blob storage. So an image will appear in blob storage, uh, effectively normally a full size image, and we'll create two, effectively two different uh, sized versions of it. <clears throat> so um, yeah, so it's going to build a, a small and a medium, and the small would have this resolution, and uh, so 640 by 400, and then an 800 by 600 image. So this allows me to then go through. So I've got my code there that's going to run. Uh, so I need to set up the integration. So the key things here on the trigger, I can click on the trigger, and then in the bottom left here, so this is triggering. Uh, it's going to look for new uh, blobs. It's going to assign them to the image parameter, and it's looking at this particular storage account, this Azure Functions, blah, 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 storage account. And then it's going to produce outputs here for the small and the medium, and it's going to use this storage account, um, but it's going to use different folders. Um, folders within, within, or containers within that storage account. So then I go through to the manage. Uh, this is disabled, so the next thing I should do to show you this is to enable it. But if I don't want it monitoring that storage account or it's not active for whatever reason, I can disable it. Um, this is where you actually delete it if you no longer want it, but I've enabled it. <clears throat> and then what I can do is go into the monitoring um, UI and uh, see the results or see, see, see what's happening. <clears throat> so while that loads up, let's keep that over there. <sighs> OK, so you can see you ran at this a couple of hours ago. So I'm bringing up a, um, it's just a, effectively a storage explorer. It's a pretty uh, small font. I apologize for that. So we can see a storage explorer. This has got my uh, storage account and then my um, image containers within that. And uh, this, the integration I showed you was looking in sample images. I've got a picture of my, one of my dogs here. Uh, I've got my sample images, and I'm going to drag a couple of other images uh, into this. So. I found a couple of images for Chicago. Um, if we, you can, uh, let's see. So, yeah, so you can see these are fairly large, 1,600 by 1,200, 2,000 by yeah, 1,300 there. So I can just drag and drop them into the, uh, the Storage Explorer, and they're copied in, in Storage Explorer as blobs. So now that everything's uh, gone OK, every few seconds, it's, it's going to look there. Some of the functions we're going to look there, look, OK, there's some new files that have appeared in sample images and uh, run the, um, the uh, thumbnails, uh, produce the thumbnails. I'm going to refresh here. This sort of tends to take about maybe 30 seconds or so to refresh. We might see this. Uh, this will refresh soon. The best thing I've found is you know, if we go into sample images, I didn't actually show you beforehand. Um, we can see Chicago 1, Chicago 2 there. Let's see in small, Chicago 1, Chicago 2. So they've appeared there. Um, 
and let me click on them. I didn't actually show you them blank. You'll have to trust me on that one. <coughs> uh, so that's the, there we go. I knew there was some there. Uh, so we can see this is the uh, 533 by 400. So these are sort of the, the different sizes. If I refresh this, I think this should have shown up here. So there we go. So a minute ago, it sort of shows um, that it found two images and uh, processed them. So hopefully that's sort of like a whirlwind tour, but hopefully you sort of get a little flavor for what some of these app services and, and functions is uh, providing and some of the sort of the benefits they have. Again, this is uh, the billing model for this is, uh, I think, on events and um, on the time. Again, it's relative on the time taken by the uh, functions as well. So, you know, you pay a bit more, obviously, for the longer the function runs. <clears throat> All right. So I'm, I'm basically out, out of time. I went probably a little long on my, my demos there. I covered this yesterday. I don't know whether anyone was there on Service Fabric. So just very quickly, Service Fabric is um, uh, an offering that we have to really allow both the, um, make it easier to develop microservices-based applications uh, as well as deploy them and monitor them and upgrade them and so on. So caters to both the developer writing the application, providing micro frameworks to make it easier to write these microservices, and then provides like the platform and the IT platform and the way to manage and monitor, monitor that and deploy microservices onto uh, uh, clusters. So sort of really take that sort of additional, you know, multi-tiered approach and really cater for, break it up into individual services and then be able to deploy it on a cluster of nodes. It could be a varying size of cluster. You might want to scale it up. You can add in more nodes. You can have more instances of particular microservices, say for web front ends, for example, um, and allow those to be just deployed to just a generic cluster of nodes and allow you to deploy that and manage that. And then also one of the key things is sort of cater for the, in the cloud you know, you're dealing with maybe, um, maybe a VM will get rebooted now and again, or you've got upgrades to do. So it will cater for monitoring the health of that cluster. It'll cater, oh, okay, this, this node has an issue, it's gone down. I'm gonna relocate these uh, my particular instances of service on another node. Uh, handle that for you. Uh, for upgrades, it'll be, it's be able to do that in stages for you so you can still maintain availability while upgrading either individual microservices that make up your application or uh, all, all of them that make up the application. So you can sort of really break it up. You go from more of a compile time contract, multi-level approach to a runtime contract with these microservices communicating each other, effectively network operations. <clears throat> and then just one of the key things, um, pretty much finished here. One of the key things is all around the, the storage and persisting the data. So, um, for example, uh, was, was Link uh, and a bunch of the Microsoft uh, large-scale cloud services sort of are built on, um, built using Service Fabric. And one of the key uh, technologies that it provides is a storage technology that really allows um, data to be persisted, um, you know, using actually a, a, a dictionary uh, pattern. Uh, persisted actually on individual nodes, um, but it's robust, so it actually data will be persisted and it will be replicated on uh, at least three, three nodes in the cluster, um, but it's on every, each of those three nodes. So you've got that data, it's local, it's very, very fast, it's very quick to do updates, but again, if there was some sort of issue or some sort of upgrade and a node goes away, um, the data's also elsewhere. So you sort of get the benefits of caching, but you've also got the ability to rapidly update the, the data. So very, very good at um, certainly parts of the data for an application, sort of very hot, frequently updated data, read, read and write very frequently. So there's a number of, of benefits in terms of scaling uh, independently. You could develop these microservices with different technology stacks, um, deploy them separately, even sort of have separate them out to my, different microservices so you can have different versions of uh, dependencies. Let me just build that. So as I said, you know, it provides capabilities to build the apps as well as deploy and manage them. And I think the sort of the key thing here, uh, key value here is the ability that yesterday in a session I did the demo where I was, had a cluster and it was on my dev box. Being, you can just as easily create a set of nodes 
five nodes, so it could be a thousand nodes, it will be effectively VMs in, in Azure, or containers in Azure for that matter, uh, or running on on-premises data centers or even other clouds, you can, you can deploy it. And you can develop, you can choose Windows or, or Linux. So very powerful um, set of capabilities for development and, and all those sort of management tasks. And these are sort of just an examples of, you can bring an executable, and you get a lot of the uh, value propositions, certainly around the, the management and deploying on the nodes and monitoring the, the uh, cluster health. And then reliable actors, reliable services are sort of the developer frameworks if you're writing your newer apps or porting your existing apps to really take full advantage of the platform. So if you, hopefully you guys get the, uh, these PowerPoints. There's a bunch of uh, links here. Um, yeah, there's basically a bunch of links, and I think that's uh, about it. So hopefully this has sort of given you the, um, really sort of given you an overview, a sort of a taste of these high-level capabilities we're making available to really improve the, your productivity to develop and upgrade and constantly innovate on these cloud applications, as well as make them easier to manage and monitor and so on. So thanks very much for the time. Enjoy the rest of your conference.